Age of Wonders 4 is the latest in the Forex series that's been going on since before I was even born. It blends turn-based campaign and battle gameplay with a high fantasy setting to give you a game that feels like a board game come to life. Of course, since it's been published by Paradox, you know that means it's going to be pretty complex and intimidating to newcomers, so I'm here to clear things up in this complete beginner's guide. There'll be timestamps in the description on that bar thingy along the bottom of the video if you want to jump around, and just before we get started, you should probably know that this is a boom 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 sponsored video. Boom boom Boom, 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 sponsored video. So just before you can get playing, you need to pick from one of the game's realms or create your own. I'm not going to go too deep into creating your own since it could easily be its own video, so we're going to pick the Greenshire since it's a good starting point without being too extreme in any direction. If you're starting out completely new to the game or genre, then Fields of Rebirth is a great place to start with a tutorial that familiarizes you with the basics on a small, easier map to get you comfortable. Selecting the green shy will take us to this screen where we can decide how far we want to be from other players, how many other players we'd like, and that's how you decide how big the map is going to be, the game's difficulty, which will change how strong and aggressive enemy players are, and if you want classic or simultaneous turns. For your first campaign, I'd leave everything on default. Classic turns should be just fine since it'll be hard to take your turn at the same time as the AI without feeling at a little bit of a disadvantage. So we'll leave all this on default and hit next where we can pick or create our faction. There are a ton to choose from with humans, different kinds of orcs, elves, frogs, halflings, and much, much more. Each one has their own playstyle with aspects unique to them and their race, but in the interest of simplicity, we're going to go with the Destined Humans. Yes, they are a little bit boring compared to the other choices, but they're very neutral so can be played a number of ways depending on what you want to do. With that selected, we load in and we can finally start playing. Upon loading in, you're going to be overwhelmed with information right from the get-go. This scroll on the right will tell you a little bit about the faction you chose to start off with, including any affinities, their style and research tome, and any traits the faction has. Hover over these traits to learn more about what sort of playstyle the faction best suits, but you can also read this when selecting your faction, so if you've done that already, just close the scroll and move on. Now we're into the game, we can break down the most exciting part. That's right, the user interface. I mean, it's related to Paradox, what do you expect? It's not as much as Stellaris, but there's still plenty to talk about, so let's blast through this real quick. In the top left, you have your knowledge, which essentially is your research speed, and you can see your active research from the button beneath this. Research is split into tomes, and you saw your starting tome on the scroll a moment ago. Each tome has a set of research projects that focus on a particular playstyle or theme. For example, the Tome of Rock has a number of rock units and spells using the elements for either damage or toughness, whereas the Tome of Souls is all about harvesting the souls of your enemies to create undead summons. Upon completing all the text in a tome, you can pick a new one, and even though there are no restrictions, some later tier tomes require you to have completed others of lower tiers and have a particular affinity, and we'll come back to what exactly this means later. Basically, try and stick to a particular playstyle or theme to get the most out of things, and in short, you can use high tier options once they unlock. Next to that, we have Imperium, which is used for a large number of things like settling new cities, speeding up diplomacy, rushing population growth, and unlocking new Empire development skills. And you earn it through income from cities. Empire development skills can be accessed from the button below, but not before turn 3. Once unlocked, you'll be greeted with this large tree going in several different directions. Each branch is linked to your affinity, and the more of each type you have, the further the branches will spread each turn. As the branches fill up, the options to pick up skills from them will become available. Options on the more populated side are only unlocked once, and options on the less populated side can be activated multiple times to gain their effects for a short time or to increase capacity multiple times. The higher the tier of skill, the more Imperium it'll cost, but also the more powerful the effects can be. You don't need to grab everything here, so have a good read, figure out what you need, and pick those up. If you want some good early picks, the general tree will be available to everyone, and most things in there are worth grabbing for pretty much every game. Back to the UI. Whispering Stones are used to negotiate with free cities, which are minor factions not controlled by the player. They can also be used on your own cities to increase stability, though try to save them for diplomacy when possible since you don't have that many. Cities explains itself, don't have more than it says, otherwise you're going to be penalised heavily in the economic department. And don't worry, there are ways to increase this limit in Empire development. Below these you have a number of different buttons that show you a ton of information. The Diplomatic Overview shows you all the other player factions in game and your relations with them. You can order these in a number of criteria and clicking on any one will open a more detailed view and let you get straight into Diplomacy. You can also go across the tabs to view free cities you know of and view all the different races you've discovered. The quest tab will show you any active quests which can be picked up from a number of places such as heroes, other players, free cities, as well as just randomly encountered on the map. You can also view all the different victory conditions and what position you are in for each of them. The hero overview shows you all the heroes you have in your faction and allows you to recruit more if you have the capacity. If you have captured any enemy heroes post battle, you'll be able to find them in the prison. Here you'll have the option to release heroes in exchange for their equipped items and increased relations with the home faction, convert them to your faction, or execute them to steal their equipment and send them to the crypt. Speaking of which, if you kill heroes, they end up in the crypt. From here, their remains can be sold to get ownership of their items and some gold. 
The Magic Materials menu shows you the different options you can find during the game, as well as the effects each bring for owning them or their collection. The Cities menu shows you all your cities, as well as everything they are producing. The Armies tab shows you all your armies, their upkeep and remaining movement range this turn. And Rally of the Legions shows you how long until the next rally. When rallies become active, you can recruit a number of units that you often can't recruit anywhere else based on your allied cities. You have a limited number of recruitment points to spend, and units here are often cheaper than recruiting them yourself, so it's well worth taking a look each time rallies occur. Moving to the middle of the screen, we have the primary resources you'll actually be spending during gameplay. Gold is of course your main currency and is spent on almost everything from buildings in cities to unit upkeep and maintaining diplomatic packs. You can never have enough and gain it through city income, vassals, battles and just about anything else that gives you a reward. Mana is your magical currency and is spent on pretty much anything magical related such as casting spells, magical buildings and upkeep on magical units. Finally, world casting points dictate how many spells you can cast on a given turn. Every spell has this as a part of their cost, but don't worry if it costs more than your capacity, it'll simply take multiple turns to cast rather than locking you out. Over on the right we have the mini map which of course shows you the map, but mini. You can toggle the economic view to get a more detailed look at what each region provides, and you can go between the surface and the underground views. The map has another map underneath it in the forms of underground, but for the most part it's just like the surface world but darker and only accessible through underground passages. Above this we have affinity and this shows all your different affinities which basically mean what your faction believes in and what kind of gameplay they suit. This is half just role playing and half affecting gameplay since opposing affinities between factions often means those factions will oppose each other in game. It also of course affects what you can unlock in empire development, what late game tomes you can unlock and sometimes affects what quests you come across and how you can approach them. Finally on the bottom right we have the campaign spells in this blue icon. This will let you choose from any of the unlock spells and cube them up for casting. Spells are unlocked from tomes and you can do a massive number of things such as increase movements of vision for units, grant other units buffs in combat, summon units, aid friendly cities or harm enemies. Every one you unlock can be worth using at a certain time so don't forget about them otherwise you're leaving a massive amount of value on the table. Again all that mana you might as well spend it. The advice button will pop up with relevant advice on what exactly you're doing so it's worth reading when you're getting started. The events log shows you everything your faction has done in the game so far. The alignments below your character portrait tells you where your faction sits in the alignments from good to evil and what effects this will bring you. And finally the end turn button which of course ends the turn. Now we've got all that out of the way we can finally talk about how to actually play the game and the first part of that is cities. Cities act as bases for your faction and over the course of the game you can have a large number but everyone starts out with one and this is known as their throne or capital city. Inside of cities you can see a massive amount of information about the city itself and surrounding regions. You can see who is the assigned governor by the portrait on the top and by clicking on this image you can see the effects they are bringing and what other heroes have to offer. The number on the castle icon indicates what level the city is and this is improved by upgrading town hall buildings. The fortification health next to this shows how tough the city is to siege when attacked and what defences it will have in battle. The stability is indicated by the face and the higher it is the better your production and income will be and if it gets low enough you can lose income and even start to lose control of your lands. You can see all the income they are generating both for themselves and in terms of production on the left and the faction resources on the right. Internal resources are food which is used for growth, production which is used for buildings and draft which is used for recruiting. Below this you see how long before your population grows and can speed it up at the cost of Imperium. When a city increases its population you can claim a nearby region for that city and choose to build from a range of improvements in each that increase the city's income in a number of ways. Some have special resources which will grant you increased income when combined with certain options so have a read of each before making your choice and claim these regions first for the added income. Below this you have that city's construction queue and clicking on the hammer lets you select projects to add to that queue. Buildings offer a massive range of bonuses to your cities from increasing their production to their stability and even unlocking new units or buildings upon completion. Good early choices are anything that increases the food or production of your city to build up their productivity for the late game. Buildings also cost gold to queue up so take it one building at a time early on so that you don't burn through all your gold in one turn. Occasionally certain buildings will have a boosted icon which reduces its construction cost by a third so it's well worth building these once boosted and looking to boost anything you want to build to get the best price. And you can see what you need to boost by hovering over each building. If you ever run out of useful things to build or really need the gold, leaving the queue empty will convert 25% of that city's production to gold for that turn so they're not totally idle. After this you have unit recruitment where you can of course recruit units for use in armies. As you upgrade your cities with buildings and increase their tiers you'll unlock new units that can be recruited so keep checking on this after each major building to make sure they are running with the best units you can. Each unit costs gold to recruit and upkeep so if you're making an entire army in one long recruitment chain recruit the cheaper to upkeep units first to save a little bit of gold. And if you're not recruiting anything 25% of your draft production will be converted to food. Finally along the bottom you can see all the regions this city has ownership of divided up by their improvements. 
New cities can be gained through conquest, vassalizing free cities, or from founding them using heroes. For the first two options we'll cover in the diplomacy section, but the second, you just move your hero into a region, click on the ground in that region, and then select build an outpost. Once it's built, you can either fortify it or make it into a fully fledged city, which will take a number of turns. Just keep an eye on your city's capacity to make sure you don't go over when you can't afford to. You can have as many outposts as you want, but cities you should try and keep limited. Also beware where you found cities since they can spread to cover quite a distance later on, so having too many too close to each other can be a waste of resources. You'll also need to make sure you don't annoy any other factions you want to keep on side when founding, so take note of any warnings before settling. Now you might be wondering what exactly a hero is since I've mentioned them quite a lot but haven't explained what they do. Heroes are the leaders of your faction and everyone starts with one who is your actual faction leader. You can recruit more later on as you increase your capacity by increasing the number of cities you control. They're used for a few things alongside founding new cities, so let's go through them one by one. As mentioned earlier, they govern your cities, granting them bonuses depending on the hero. They can also be used in combat and more often than not become some of the most powerful units in your faction and elevate any army they are in to new heights. They come in all shapes and sizes but you can really build them to do whatever you want. Inspecting one from the hero's dropdown will take you to the hero customization screen where you can change pretty much everything about them. For starters, you can adjust their appearance to look however you want as long as however you want is along these sliders. You can also change their gear using any items you have in your faction's inventory. And you can find items post battle and through trading so it's well worth swapping things out regularly to make sure heroes are at the top of their game. You can change their weapons, armor, mounts or miscellaneous items that can change up how they attack, what kinds of damage they deal, how tanky they are and even give them unique battle abilities. There's such a large number of items that it takes far too long to go through them all but whenever you find something post battle, take a look to see if it's worth equipping to your heroes for some extra power. As they fight and win, they also gain XP which can be spent on skills to make them better at certain aspects of gameplay. There's Warfare which increases theirs and allied units general combat effectiveness, Battle Magic which of course increases the efficacy of spells used in combat, and Support which unlocks various abilities and makes them better at leading your army from the back. It's best to pick what you want your lord to do in combat at the start and then choose skills and items that complement that rather than trying to be a jack of all trades. But don't worry, you can reset skills if you make a mistake or want to change things up. Finally, along the top you have signature skills which are themed around the different affinities and will grant unique skills to your heroes every 5 levels. Again, it works best if you keep to a certain theme or affinity when selecting these to get the absolute most out of heroes in your faction rather than spreading them too wide. And lastly, try your absolute best not to lose heroes in battle, especially your faction leader. Faction leaders come back every time but will be banished to the void for a number of turns which will cause their empire to fall into chaos with severe penalties until they return, so avoid this at all costs if you can. Of course, one hero can't win battles alone, at least not to begin with, so they need to be backed up by an army to even the odds. Armies are made of up to 6 units and that includes any heroes. That being said, unlike certain other games, they don't need a hero to lead your armies and can quite easily function without one, which is great since you can need many more armies than you have heroes if you are in a large scale conflict. Armies are simply created when you recruit any kind of unit from a hero to a lowly peasant conscript. Merging units together is as simple as walking them on top of each other or having an army sitting in a city whilst it's recruiting so you can group units up or send them out one by one if you really want, though I'm not sure why you'd ever do that. There's a massive range of units within each faction, each with their own specific powers, abilities and weaknesses, so instead of going through them all, we'll go through the types. Pole arms are any units with spears, that so are anti-large experts taking out large targets and cavalry with ease. Alongside this, they can resist and even reflect enemy charges, so make for excellent flank protectors. Shield units are great defensive melee troops, not often the tankiest units you have and will be absorbing all kinds of punishment to keep other troops safe. Shock units are highly offensive and charge straight through enemy lines to disrupt formations and attack sensitive units before they can be stopped. Skirmisher units normally are very fast and great at flanking enemies with either ranged or melee damage and are very hard to pin down. Fighter units are general melee battlers without any real main power or counter so are pretty good all round. Ranged units are of course best to attack from a range and need a good line of sight to be most active and also want to avoid melee at all costs to keep their damage output up and of course keep themselves alive. Battle mages use ranged magic to deal damage and weaken target enemies and also want to avoid melee at all costs. Support units do what they say and support friendly units with a range of buffs and abilities to reduce the power of enemy magic. And finally scout units are exceptionally weak in battle and are instead used for exploring the world with large movement range and vision allowing them to move around very quickly to clear up the map in no time. You can make armies of whatever units you want but you have to remember that every unit kind has its own strengths and weaknesses. So as a complete opposite to heroes where you want to laze folks on one area, here being a jack of all trades is just fine. With a sturdy front line, some powerful ranged and a little support here and there, it's just fine. Of course you can't fit every unit type into such small armies so do your best to build powerful balanced armies and if you need other unit types you can always send two armies to do the job to have the best of both worlds. So now you have your armies you probably want to know how exactly to battle. It's as simple as walking up to an enemy army and you'll be given the choice of manually fighting, auto fighting or retreating. 
The auto battle will also tell you how risky the battle is, which gives you a good idea of how likely it is that you'll lose units or the army. If you auto battle and you don't like the results, you can always retry it manually and try to do better yourself. No matter if you do this or go manual right out the gate, you'll be tossed into the turn-based combat arena, and don't worry, turns in combat don't affect turns in campaign, so feel free to take your time. Each battle will place you in a combat area that's themed to where the battle is taking place and the environmental obstacles to be worked around or taken advantage of depending on your playstyle. Each turn, your units have three action points, which they can spend, and certain actions consume different amounts. Moving a short distance will only use one, but further distances can spend up to two. Attacks can cost any amounts depending on the unit, but they almost always end that unit's turn, so choose wisely when to attack to ensure you aren't left in a vulnerable position. Melee units of course have to be next to other units to attack, but anything with range damage will have a dotted radius around them, indicating their firing range, and when moving them around, you'll see the chances of landing hits on units within that range. Most units can also defend, which will increase their defense to reduce any incoming damage significantly. You also have to worry about what direction units are facing, as defending is useless if enemies hit you in the back on top of the bonus damage that they will get from flanking. Once units get into range, you can attack, and by clicking on an attack ability and hovering over enemies, it shows you the damage you will deal and any that will be returned to you in the form of retaliation. Ranged attacks have a chance to miss, so choose a lot more carefully to ensure you're not wasting your turn. More advanced units like your heroes may also have some powerful abilities they can use, such as area damage or heals, so read everyone's actions before just clicking to attack to make sure you get the best outcome you can. You also have a selection of spells at your disposal based on what tomes you've researched, and these can be used to give your army an advantage in combat. Each spell has its own cooldown, and each cast costs mana and combat casting points, which basically means you have a limited number of casts per battle based on how many tomes you've researched. As far as winning battles, it's hard to give solid advice since every battle is different, but some good tips that work in every scenario are focused on the highest threat units first, so anything that deals a lot of damage, especially if it's quite fragile itself, and of course protect your own high damage units to maintain their output. Try to avoid letting enemies flank you since it skyrockets any damage they deal and puts you on the back foot, and of course try to flank them as much as possible when safe to get off extra damage. In general, keeping your units fairly close together is the way to go to keep units safe from being surrounded. That being said, if the enemy has a lot of area abilities, then spreading out a little bit can prevent a lot of damage in the right situation. As long as you play for exactly what's in front of you, you can't go too far wrong. And if it doesn't go well, you can retry combat as many times as you want, so get a lot of practice in. But aside from the monsters you encounter in the world, how do you know who you should be fighting and who's a friend? Well, that's where diplomacy comes in. Diplomacy varies based on who you're interacting with. First of all, you have free cities, who are single city nations that are not players in the game and instead just keeps to themselves for the most part. When you meet one of these, you can choose to give them a Whispering Stone, which will increase your relations with them over time, progressing from friends all the way to vassals, where they give you gold per turn in exchange for protection. Reaching the maximum level of vassalization will allow you to integrate the city into your faction, giving you total control of the city and any armies they were in control of, including heroes. This is a great way to expand early, since chances are you'll be the only one talking to that free city, so you can buddy up to them at your leisure and collect a large sized city for your trouble. If you want to speed things along, you can also spend increasing amounts of Imperium to give a boost to your relations to get them on side quicker. You can also trade resources with any free cities you're friendly with to exchange some resources for another, but it's not too in-depth. Of course, if you don't have the patience for getting them on side or just want to take the world by force, you can declare war on them and invade with armies to take them over. This negatively affects your alignment and can be a lot more challenging, especially early on, so think before committing to what could easily be a lengthy war if you don't vastly overpower them. The other quote-unquote player factions can also be discovered over the course of the game, and you can interact with them a lot more in-depth than three cities. Upon meeting, you can choose to influence relations either way right out the gates or get straight to negotiating. You can trade basically everything from resources to territory, enact treaties to allow each other through your lands, or jump to each other's aid when courting wars. You can declare that faction as a friend to improve the relations over time at the cost of gold, or as a rival to do the same thing but for negative relations. Factions can also have grievances against each other, and these come in many forms, such as trespassing in their lands, settling too close to their cities and more. You can denounce factions, which lowers their relations with other factions you have both met based on a grievance. And if you have no grievances, you can also just make one up. Finally, you can of course declare war on other factions, and for this to be justified not make you more evil in the eyes of others. Justification can range from a grievance they have formed against you, to them just being the opposite alignment to you and your allies. Try to make sure you're justified as often as you can to ensure the least penalties against you. A war can be ended at any time by negotiating peace if both sides can come to an agreement. If peace can't be reached, then combat is inevitable. We've already been over the fights between armies, but when attacking cities, it's just a little bit different. Instead of going straight to battle, you begin a siege, which will take a number of turns before you can attack the settlement. During the siege, you can build siege projects, which will help you during the eventual battle. Once the timer runs out, you have the option of moving in to attack the city whenever you want. Once you do, it's like any other battle where you can choose to auto battle or fight manually. If you fight manually, you'll see that the map is a lot different with any siege engines built by either side available for use, as well as defender walls and palisades in various states of disrepair, again, depending on how long the siege was and what exactly you built during it. 
These can be a lot harder than regular battles with the defenders having a lot of fortifications to work with, but just like any other battle, they can be won if you play them right, so just use the same tips as before to get the job done. Upon winning a siege battle, you'll have a large number of options on what to do with the captured city. You can vassalize it to turn into a vassal loyal to you, raise it and wipe it from the ground to gain some gold, migrate it to either of the other races in your faction to take it over using them, but this will negatively affect your alignment since, uh, obviously, or simply absorb it into your empire with the race currently occupying it and it becomes another of your cities. So now you know how to start and win wars, but how do you actually win the game? There are four different victories you can progress towards in your campaign. Military requires you to defeat every non-allied faction in the game using combat by defeating their leader and capturing their throne city. Expansion requires you to be in control of a certain percentage of all regions on the map. Doing so unlocks buildings called Beacons of Unity, and when three are built, you can attempt to light them. After this, you'll need to defend them for 15 turns to get the win. Magic requires you to build three special affinity province improvements in three different cities. Once built, you'll be able to start channeling the victory spell and must defend each location for 15 turns to get the win. Finally, score victory, which means you need to have the high score by the time you reach the turn limit, which can be set at the start of the game and by default is 150. Score is gained via basically everything you do, so having a strong economy, powerful armies, and a lot of land and power. I choose one of the first three to focus on, and score should just happen anyway, and will be fell back on if the game goes on too long. No matter what you do, you'll need to build up your empire and cities to be as productive and profitable as possible, stack your armies with the best units you can, and make sure you are one of the most dominant factions in the game in every way you can. If you do that and follow the tips laid out in this video, then you should be on your way to a victory in no time. And that's just about everything you need to know to play Age of Wonders 4. Thanks to Paradox sponsoring the video. Like, subscribe, and if you want more high fantasy strategy gaming content, then check out this video here with some of the most powerful mechanics in Warhammer 3.